Hi, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Flynn. I'm the popular library manager at the downtown Cleveland Public Library, the main library. And I'm so excited to welcome you and our two authors tonight, uh, Laura Maylene Walter and Marie Vibbert. And thanks for joining me, ladies. It's wonderful to Thank be here. Thank you for having us. Yeah, this is fun. Oh, great. So um, a few things I just wanted to mention. You can we can get your books through the library or at Loganberry Books, where you're going to be signing copies tomorrow, I heard. Yes, yes, we will be signing uh, tomorrow. So if anyone wants a personal inscription, we can do that. Just let Loganberry know. Oh, that's great. And um, also I wanted to quickly talk about the Ohio Center for the Book, which is located in our literature department at the main library downtown. Uh, we feature a collection of Ohio authors and um, have events that support local authors. So um, please come and visit us there too. And I wanted to throw it over to Marie and explain our theme for the evening. Right, so I just felt that there's few enough times in your life that you get to just unabashedly be a princess and I think that one's book launch should be one of that so so I convinced Laura and Sarah that we would wear tiaras today um, and they wanted me to show you my tiara pig this is my tiara pig tiara pig you heard that right yes isn't it. she cute she's fabulous she's like a unicorn pig and I use her to store my tiaras so I may change out my tiaras as the evening goes <laughs> as the evening goes on <laughs> And have I, have, a I have a guest visitor. Thanks. You've been warned. <laughs> and Chihuahua. Yes. Um, so I know um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, the genres of your books and um, that Marie, yours is more sci-fi, whereas Laura, yours is literary with sci-fi elements. And maybe just talk a little bit about, um, you know, genres of the books and genre bending and different perceived notions of the genres. My book is think, actually, oh, oh no. I was gonna say take it away because you have a clearer answer than I think I do. So you should definitely kick us off. I have a clear answer, but it is also kind of weird because my book is something of a throwback. Um, modern science fiction isn't quite what I wrote. Um, and some people have called it space opera, but usually when people talk about space opera, they expect it to have court intrigue and maybe magic. Um, and it doesn't have either of those, but it does have faster than light spaceships, um, which are for individual people to fly as though it was a motorcycle there. It's a space motorcycle story. So it's, kind of hearkening back to like the, the stories that I read as a kid and not being too serious about science fiction while at the same time saying, you know, I mostly want this to be plausible to a real world. Um, I, I really only break one rule and that is that, you know, you can fly from planet to planet really fast and you can communicate via Ansible. Um, Cause why, if you're going to have FTL, you have to have Ansibles. So, building on a long tradition of genre fiction and science fiction itself isn't just one monolithic genre, right? I mean, you have stuff that's more fabulous. You have things that are more um, hard science fiction. I've, I've, I could write a whole dissertation about what gets called hard science fiction and what doesn't. Um, I had. I would like to read that very much. So if you write that, send it to me, please. I will. I will. I, I had a story that I did tons of research for, and somebody labeled it science fantasy, and I was like, hmm. "But why?" <laughs> so a genre is is. I think genre is what you make of it. Um, I think it can be helpful. It helps audiences find what they're interested in. I know that if a book has stars or a spaceship on the cover, I'm gonna be more interested. Um, but I'm not necessarily gonna be more interested. So I also enjoy Laura's work and more books like it. That, that's my good segue to you. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I have my obligatory cat uh, show and tell here, Cirrus. He, he's gotten really good about jumping on my lap right when the event starts, so I appreciate his timing. Um, I, I wonder, Marie, maybe, you know, when you 
finished reading my book, you could just tell me what it is and what you think the genre is, because I've been really fascinating, uh, fascinated as time has gone by, as I've talked about my book about Body of Stars more and more, that I feel my answer has degraded to this question where I, I, you know, I've always been a literary writer. I come from sort of the literary fiction world and I consider my book speculative literary fiction, but it does have sort of, uh, some people are calling it a bit more science fiction. It's speculative in the sense where it doesn't take place in our real world. It takes place in a world where predicting the future is possible specifically through the skin of women and girls, through the patterns of their moles. And so, you know, just with that premise, it sets it, it sets it up to have certain maybe genre expectations. And, and, you know, sometimes I just think it's a really hard question to answer. I just think of it as literary fiction with a twist, I suppose. But there's a lot in, in the literary world, a lot is behind these genre questions. Sometimes there's some snobbery behind it um, or readers bring different expectations. Sometimes I think some readers just don't care what it's called. They just want a good book. And that's sort of the camp I tend to fall into most. I try to we read fairly widely, but I do love literary fiction. Um, and so I just, when I wrote the book, I just wanted to write a story that really compelled me. And that's what I tried to do. It reminds me a little bit of The Power by Naomi mm, Altman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which some does people get have called compared science it fiction. To that. Um, but again, yeah. I feel like, I think you're right. I think a lot of how we assign these labels comes into question, right? Yeah, yeah. Because then there's, and there's gatekeepers on both sides. There are science fiction snobs who are like, no, there's no scientific explanation for these moles. Um, oh sure, yeah. That would they would not be happy with my book because, no. like, spoiler, it's it's not physically possible. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that is true. I just did an event the other night with Erica Swiler and and her book um, Light from Other Stars, which is really fantastic. If anyone out there um, hasn't read it yet, but she talked about getting criticism from that science community of saying that um, the science in her book didn't all, it wasn't all realistic, but she basically has a machine in that book that can stop time. And it's, you know, if we had that machine, it would be a very different world. So, yeah. Um, I did want to also ask about um, your experiences in getting your books published, because I know they were different. Marie, wanna, I want to hear your story. So yeah, my yeah. Story, tell, like, us, tell us from up. beginning to end how you published. That's great, though. I mean, that's kind of standard for a writer, right? Having yeah. a messed up story. So please share with us. <laughs> OK, so I first wrote this novel when I was 15. Um, and it was terrible. Don't 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 read too much into that. And I rewrote it and I wrote some short stories based on it. And then I revised it. And then a couple years ago, I was doing, it was 2012, I was doing the Clarion Write-a-thon and I wrote it as a short story that turned out to be about 10,000 words long. And my writer's workshop was said, this was a novel. So that year for NaNoWriMo, I made it a novel. And then the next year I polished it. And then I had, you know, and then I was like, okay, this is good. This is actually good. It has a plot, it has a beginning and a middle and an end. It has space motorcycles. I should be able to sell this. I've sold 50 short stories. I had a good pitch, you know, it's a female biker gang in outer space rescues a gay prince. Bam, I threw that pitch at an agent at a, at a celebration for, it was a celebration for like Asimov's magazines, like whatever -th anniversary, I don't remember, I'd have to look up a couple years ago, they had a big party in New York and I got invited because I'd been in Asimov magazine and I showed up and I met this agent and I pitched it and she said she'd look at it and she rejected it. And then a buddy introduced me to his agent and he rejected it. And I went to querytracker.com and I spent two years, I got about 46 query letter rejections. I got about four um, partial manuscripts. All the partials turned into full manuscript requests, but they all also turned into rejections. Um, it just Rejection, rejection, rejection. There was an open call at, at Apex. They rejected it. There was an open call at Bain Books. They sent me like a, you're a terrible person because there's no way sh that a faster than light ship could be small. We just couldn't read the rest of the book because that was absurd. 
that was their rejection. It was like, that's a little too personal, dudes. I mean, I have space motorcycles and the thing you're worried about is they're too small. Um, so like I began to despair after years and years of trying to sell it. And one day I just randomly was revising it because I'm always revising my work and I tweeted there's so much more writing I should be working on, but I keep revising the space biker gang novel. And I got a reply from a guy who's like, hey, could you send that to me? I'm I'm a publisher. I'm starting a, starting a publishing house. And I was like, okay, here it is. My query letter sucks. And he responded, yeah, your query letter does suck. Okay, but I want to <laughs> read it. And then like two weeks later, he's like, I want to buy it. So that's how I sold it. Um, vernacular books wow. is a small brand new I'm, I think I'm like their third or fourth book um, so they're that it was a tweet it was a tweet there's, guys there's so much about that story that I I'm trying to unpack in my mind right now live and it's hard but I mean the fact that you use Twitter in a way that got you your first novel published um, instead of using it to distract yourself or you know doom scroll or be obnoxious about self-promotion. Uh, I just think that's great. And also how much your idea was so exciting that, you know, for the editor to say you had, a, he thought your query was bad, <laughs> but still wanted to read the book. I mean, it wasn't that bad, right? I'm um, yeah. still really excited by the idea. So you were clearly doing a, a lot, right? And I find that really interesting because I, I approached everything like getting an agent, all of that from more of the literary side. And in terms of publishing a science fiction novel, like truly in that genre, not like my book, but really in that genre, my understanding is there are a lot fewer editors and a lot of fewer agents who also represent um, science fiction like your book. Is that right? Would you say that's I have no idea. I mean, as far know. as I know, okay. agents are unicorns from the planet Mars. I've met some people <laughs> who claimed to be agents. I don't quite believe them. Um, someday I will find one. <laughs> well, and there is also so much in your story, you know, when you just started repeating the word rejection a bunch of times, that's so, um, so I almost wanted to call it, and it's, I mean, it's standard, right? But it's its just the norm of the experience, I think, for almost everyone. And so I could say for me, Getting Body of Stars published, my publication journey for this book, I view it as extending well before this book even existed. So I had been writing, um, sorry to adjust my tiara. I had been writing and trying to write novels for years before I started Body of Stars. I had written a few I call them like my young novels that I was really, they were my training ground. And I tried to get agents for about two of those and it didn't work out. And I, I can go through all my old records sometime, but I think if you add up all my agent rejections from both of those books, it would be at least, at least 200, maybe, maybe more. I can't even remember. I had a lot of close calls. Um, I had an agent call my house when I was very young with my first book that didn't work out. And it was just steady stream of rejection. And I had to come to terms with realizing that those books were not ready. Like they weren't good enough for what I was, my vision, what I was trying to do. I was trying to go all in and find an agent and sell the book to a big publisher. And so for me and for a lot of other writers to do that, I just had to wait and write more books. And I knew when I started writing Body of Stars, I, I think I knew innately that this could be the one, but it, then it took me years of revising it, rewriting it, putting it aside for you know a solid year or, or more, and then coming back to it, you know, having it, you know, throwing it on my writing friends again and again to have them read and give me feedback, and then working on parts of it so hard for so long, and then just deleting what I did and redoing it completely from scratch. So all of this is to say that eventually, when the manuscript was getting in better shape and I was ready to find an agent, um, I was ready to look for an agent again. I had this list of contacts of agents who had read my previous work and had really nice things to say about it, and they, they remembered me. They remembered who I was. And so when I started querying, I kept it to a much smaller batch of agents, and I started, you know, they all wanted to read the full manuscript. I was getting positive results. And it turns out the agent I signed with was not one I had any previous contact with. It was, um, she's 
you know, I had never known her before. And she was the first one to make an offer of representation. And, and from there, it was just more revision until she put it on submission. And I was very lucky that Dutton was enthusiastic about it. And so this is just to say, it was a really long tangled journey that I could have easily looked at all those agent rejections of the past and thought, you know, 200 agent rejections or whatever it was, uh, I could easily have said, well, I'm just not good enough or I just don't have what it takes. And I think, I think I wasn't good and I didn't have what it took back then and I had to just stick with it and keep going. And so it was a really long process and I don't want to ramble on too much, but um, Marie, I'll be interested if people, since your book has come out, if you've kind of gotten the very broad question, like how did you get a publisher or how did you do it? And it's, for me, I feel like that question is so vast that it's not something I can just, you know, write down in two sentences, like here's, you know, you can't just call 1-800-RANDOM-HOUSE or Penguin Random House or whatever. It's, it takes such a lot. It takes um, pouring in so much of yourself and being willing to get all those rejections as well. Or maybe it's as easy as sending a tweet. I don't know, maybe. I mean, I mean I'm like, just like, well, like sell a short story to a guy who's an anthology editor who decides to start his yeah. own imprint and then make a witty tweet. So yeah, try to do that on purpose. <laughs> Let us know how it goes. Yeah. Let us know how you go. It, complete accident. I could not do this again on purpose. <laughs> um, I was also wondering about the difference between publishing short stories and novels. If you could tell me about Publishing that. short stories is a much more logical and straightforward business and I love it. Oh, hey. Um, Ooh, we're going to have different answers. So I'm really interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> OK, publishing a science fiction short story. Uh, thanks to the Science Fiction Writers of America, there are uh, industry standards that are adhered to. To become a CIFWA, SFWA, CIFWA is how we say it, qualified market, you have to pay eight cents a word. You're expected to have certain clauses in your contract. You know, you're, you're buying first English language rights, you're not holding them for more than a year, you know, you have uh, reprint rights and you pay if there's going to be a translation, you pay extra if it's going to be a podcast. Um, we as science fiction writers are blessed to have a, a advocating body like CIPWA that allows that to happen. So when I sell a story to Analog or FNSF or Lightspeed or Escape Pod, wherever I send my short stories, I generally know what I'm going to get for them. Um, and the contracts are pretty much the same. And the turnaround times are much faster. The big difference between the literary world and the science fiction world is in science fiction, you do not simultaneously submit. I send my story to Analog, I gotta wait till Analog answers before I send my story to Asimov's. In the literary world, you take one story, you send it to everybody and whoever gets back to you gets back to you, right? And that's why literary magazines might not even get back to you. But science fiction magazines, they always get back to you. Some of them get back to you way fast. Clark's World has like an average turnaround time of three days. Um, my friend Ferret even joked that, yeah, I start writing a short story and Neil Clark throws a brick through my window with a no on it. Because <laughs> it feels <laughs> really, it's that fast. Um, so I use a, I use a free online uh, crowdsourced um, database called the Submission Grinder, um, Diabolical Plots, and the, that's the thegrinder.diabolicalplots.com. Check it out. Um, it's free. I donate to them. They're really awesome. But I'm able to search by what market is open, paying at least eight cents a word that the story hasn't been to, and then I sort by their average response times and I send to the fast response place first and the slow response place last. So analog is my dump market. Love you, Trevor. Um, so, and, and then, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I've gotten into a habit of it where I try to have between 15 and 20 short stories out on submission at a time. Um, I sold 22 stories last year, which is a record for me. I have sold one story this year. This year sucks, um, but so yeah. I mean, it. I know how to sell short stories. Selling novels is like 
monstrous. It's terrible. I think there are more people trying to buy to sell a novel than buy a novel on any given Sunday. Um, it feels that way anyway. You mean people, writers trying to sell their books versus readers buying the book? Is that what you yes. mean? Yes. I think yeah. there oh, are yeah. more oh, for sure. selling novels than reading novels. Somehow they yeah. have to write them without reading. <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> I would say. Um, well, it's really, it's really fascinating for me to listen to Marie talk because about her experiences publishing in science fiction markets, because in so many ways, you know, we're both writers. And by the way, I don't know if we mentioned this, but our novels came out exactly a week apart this year. Hers came out March 9th and mine came out March 16th, which is just really, really nice that two Cleveland authors, um, our books are very, very different, but they both have that starry element, hence our outfits. I don't know if you can see, but I'm wearing stars and Marie is wearing planets, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. All right. Um, so, so we have a lot of similarities. You know, we're both writers who've just been in the trenches, writing for a long time, really caring about writing for a long time, and being invested in it, but getting rejection, powering through that. But ultimately, I mean, hearing hearing her experiences, it seems so different from what what I've experienced coming into my career as more of a literary writer. So I have always written short stories. I love writing short stories. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I published more in the past and lately though, I've been focusing more on novels, but uh, it's the literary markets. They are slow um, for a lot of reasons. I also edit one. So I understand from the editorial side why it's so slow and why there's no money in it and all of these things. So if you are in the Cleveland area watching this, I assume most of you are. Uh, Gordon Square Review is Literary Cleveland's. Um, it's an international online journal. And that's what um, I work on that with them. So you could We'll have a new issue out next month. So just to put a small plug in for that. So I love the literary journal world. I love reading literary magazines when I can, but submitting to them, it's incredibly competitive. Sometimes, I mean, everything's hard, but sometimes it almost seems harder to get into some of these competitive literary magazines than to find an agent almost. They're, they're that tough, there's that much competition. And they can take forever. I would say normal response times are probably like six months to eight months, but definitely they can go longer than that. I recently had, a, I think, a over two year rejection on, on a piece that, um, and it was a nice personal rejection too, but over two years. It had better and, be. <laughs> well, no, I mean, usually I you would expect it would just, yeah, be a form letter. Um, it was one of those situations where I I was not happy with the long wait and I had you know no hopes they would publish it, but I didn't withdraw it because I was like, let's just ride this out. Like, let's just see how many years I can go until they get back to me. Um, and most of them do get back to you, but sometimes they won't get back to you. And so there's usually little money. If you start getting in the better journals, there is more money. But as over the years, I've kind of, started putting some more either fantasy elements in some of my stories or they've gotten weirder or maybe a little more genre bending e and so i have been able to try to submit to some of the science fiction publications where appropriate and i mean what a different world they do get back to you fast they pay a lot more money and they have a lot they have readers the big ones have a lot of readers and literary journals are kind of famous for having a low readership it's like a passion project for everyone involved but you don't when you you know publish in the average literary magazine you don't expect that thousands of people are going to read your story so i mean it's something that i think it's clearly just a, a labor of love for everyone for the editors for the writers who, who want to write that kind of fiction and see it in a publication. And the other thing I wanna point out is these things do add up. It can seem, especially if you're on the literary side, it can seem like, oh, I got my story in this journal and I, I got paid like $25 and no one's reading it. And it can feel at times a bit of a downer. But I do have to say it adds up. You never know what that will lead to. I think every step is building your career. You can you know, become good friends with one of the other contributors in the journal if you meet them at an event. 
hopefully in the future when we could have events again. Um, or just you never know what will hit readers in a certain lucky moment. And you never know if you don't have an agent. You know, a lot of agents do look at these journals and seek writers out. So that's actually my agent came to me first. Um, I think it wasn't even a publication. I think it was like a contest credit or something I had and she was reading about me and so she contacted me and that's happened to me a few times actually agents reaching out in the past and so like Marie you were saying that you were published in a certain magazine and then you were invited to a conference because of that publication and you met someone and even if that connection didn't work out it's every step along the way you're kind of building your career you're gaining experience and you're sort of building up your your credits and so whether you know you're getting a lot of readers and a lot of money with a science fiction publication or not in a literary publication, I think they're both very valuable and worth a writer's time for sure. Great, and um, I know we talked about this, but um, I wanted to know more about the writing communities in Cleveland and how they've supported you and how they've helped you in your journey. I've definitely had some very direct support from my science fiction writers workshop, the Cajun Sushi Hamsters from Hell. Um, that's our name. That's great. Cajun Sushi Hamsters from Hell. We have a Wikipedia page. Um, <laughs> uh, founded by Mary Terzillo, who has a nebula. I think she has two nebulas. Maybe I'm wrong. She has a nebula award for sure. And her husband, uh, Jeff Landis, who has three Hugos. I remember him complaining because one Hugo was I have a Hugo, two Hugos was I have multiple Hugos, three Hugos was the same. Um, <laughs> like Tough problem to have, Jeff. So the Cajun Sushi Hamsters meet once a month. We're a pro-level science fiction writing workshop. You have to apply to get in. I applied to get in when I was 16 um, because I wanted to be a protege, or not protege, what's the word? Prodigy, I thought I was a prodigy. I was not a prodigy. Um, but Mary let me in anyway, and they're uh, great people. And it's great to have just first readers, to have a writing workshop. Um, I'd also shout out to Max Bax, who's been super supportive to local writers forever. Um, invited me to do a reading with Steve Swinarski, another Cajun sushi hamster. And Apple Tree Books, I did their Writer in the Window program and loved it and got a lot of words down and they invited me for Small Business Saturday to do a signing. And I don't think short story writers ever get invited to bookstores to do signings. I think this was very unique and I'm very grateful to them for that. Um, well, for me, I also have a writing group here in Cleveland. So if any of you are watching, hello, everyone. We don't have a name, I don't think. Um, so there's another difference between, I guess, literary more literary side of the business and science fiction. I guess you get a really great name with your group when you're a science fiction writer. I don't know. We'll have to talk about that and see if I can convince everyone to come up with a name. Um, so I have that writing group, which is so helpful. And I also, you know, one of my favorite things to do on the literary side back before COVID was to go to Brews and Prose, the monthly reading series. It's so good. And that's actually where Marie and I would, she brought a, she has a beer I brought tonight a beer in honor, in honor of, of Brews and Prose. <laughs> I, I sadly did not. Um, so I hope it comes back. I, I don't know what the situation is, but clearly because of COVID it couldn't happen, but it's just a great reading series. And so that's where I would get to see people like Marie and, and other local writers or just people who love to come to come out to literary events. And um, otherwise in the community, I mean, I, I've met two of my best writing friends, actually the people I dedicated Body of Stars to. I met them here in Cleveland, Huda and Jennifer, and they don't live here anymore, sadly, but um, I think they did wish they lived here. It's really funny that I think, you know, back when they lived in Cleveland, it was maybe like the utopian period in, in our writing friendship when we were all in the same city and we could all, we would meet at cafes and write. And so that was really helpful. All the local bookstores here. Are so we have so many great independent bookstores. It's really amazing. And so just shout out to Loganberry for tonight because they're the ones selling the books for tonight. I love Loganberry. 
I assume most people watching this have been there, but if you haven't, you have to check it out. It's a huge, beautiful bookstore with a purple color scheme, which I'm a big fan of. That's my favorite color. And they have a cat. Well, I think now they have two cats sort of part time, but Otis was always the longstanding cat there. So fantastic bookstore. Um, if you if you don't buy our books there today, I hope you buy another book to support Logan Berry because we all need to support our bookstores. And other than that, um, I might talk a little later about libraries, I'm thinking, but I just think Cleveland, I really think it's a great place to be a writer. You don't have to be in New York to be a writer. You really don't. And I feel like the money you save by living in Cleveland versus living in New York, you can really put that toward time to to work on your craft which to be a writer that's the most important thing it's just working you know reading and writing and reading and writing over and over again for a long sustained period of time yeah and when i went to that party for asmovs that was just a 50 dollar bus ticket man you can day trip new york i'm just saying if you need to <laughs> um and I know um, we have some questions from Facebook coming up, but I know we talked about um, having you read a short excerpt from your books. Would you want to do that now? Then we'll get into some some other questions. Okay, I'll go first. And Great, I'll go. Yes. very short excerpt. Are we ready for the excerpt? Yes. This is this is from uh, the first chapter. Galactic Hellcats. He slipped out the window when Ethan was asleep again. She kept off the streets, taking fire escapes and balconies and railings where she could until she got to a favorite spot of hers, an old graceful bridge. Too beautiful for the neighborhood, but then they didn't exactly tear things down for that reason. The water below was an opaque oil slick reflecting the city, but it moved like a living thing. How was it people were so fragile and things like that just kept going? She wiped her runny nose with the back of her hand. She should toss the storage locker key in. It would be a grand gesture. It would feel good. She knew she wouldn't. Ethan was right. She was a mercenary. She would do the awful dreary thing and sort through his stuff and fence what she could and count it all up and check the black market prices for retroviruses and gene therapies. It wouldn't be enough. Nothing ever was. She had to think bigger. Key walked across the bridge on a blostrade that was outside a chain link fence meant to keep people from walking on it. Big boats chugged by the size of buildings, always looking like they weren't in a hurry. A boat heist? How would she haul it in? Ethan wasn't going to die, not now, not ever, so he didn't need a legacy. It wouldn't hurt to check out the resources he had on hand, though, if they could prevent the whole dying thing. There had to be something in there to buy time, the time to plan a real heist. The street was indifferently paved in a variety of asphalts like giant toddlers had had a mud and concrete fight, and their parents moved away rather than clean it up. Key left it for a dirt track along the riverbank. Sometimes in a city, you could forget there was dirt under everything. She liked the funk of it, of the river, and the tough prickly things that managed to grow between the smooth path and the corrugated metal of the river channel. I think I'll stop there. I don't want to read too long. Short. Short. Okay, great. Thanks, Marie. And I do, I just want to say for everyone out there watching that Marie's book is incredibly fun. It's a space adventure with hijinks and it's it's funny and it's lively and it's um, really imaginative. And so, and it's called Galactic Hellcats, which I mean, what is it? I know, I picked so. a kind of down bit. I just, I thought I yeah. like that bit of scene description, whatever. Yeah. Um, and I'll just read just a really short section. Um, I'm trying to, I tried to pick something that I haven't read for any other event. And so I feel I should probably to, to set it up. So my book is Body of Stars is set in a world where the patterns of moles and freckles on women and girls' bodies foretell the future. So there is a moment, girls are born with one set of markings and when they go through what would be like puberty in our world, they 
their marking shift once and um, gives them their full adult outline of future predictions. So it's really this anxious, tense moment where as they get older, they know this is about to happen. And so they know that they're going to have a whole new map to their future. Um, it just happens kind of magically when they wake up one day. And in addition, at that time, for a few weeks, they have really heightened senses. It's called high lucidity. And so they are really kind of just raw to the world and just sort of much more um, in tune with everything. So I'm going to read just a handful of pages and then we can get to questions. I'm going to read from the moment that my narrator Celeste wakes up and she has her new markings. She has been transformed overnight. The night had passed in chills and drafts, the quilt a heavy weight on my body. I did not want to lift it away. I did not want to see what had changed. I lay there feeling my skin touching my pajamas, which touched the sheets, which touched the blankets, which touched the quilt. I could hear the beating of my heart. It was the day before my 16th birthday. Time was moving forward, the future shifting, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. I pushed off the quilt and stood. Slowly, shivering with the cold of morning, I dropped out of my pajamas. I avoided the full-length mirror since reflections could distort markings and looked down at the new future made manifest on my body. My skin flashed before me, a swerving wreck of predictions. I shut my eyes, disoriented. The morning sun seeped brassy and strong through my eyelids. I could feel it, thermal energy, the hot center of the earth. I cracked open my right eye to see sunlight shimmering between the slats of the closed blinds, a wavering vision of heat and salt and painful bright. I sensed the blood moving through my veins, spreading outward like the branches of a tree. I could hear it too, along with the thrumming of my heart, the rustle of the leaves outside and the wind coursing over grass. This was survival level hearing, the kind meant for wild animals, for the hunted and the primeval. And then came the smells, an egg frying downstairs, a wisp of old bleach in the bathroom, the spots of dried toothpaste on the medicine cabinet mirror. I bent forward, gasping for air, which I could feel moving in and out of my lungs, every ragged, desperate gulp, as if someone had turned me inside out. And I think I'll stop there just to keep it short so that we can move on and uh, make sure we get to all the questions. Oh, nice. Um... We have um, a question. Both of you have cool titles for your books. How did you come up with the titles? I stole mine. Um, when I wrote the book in junior high school, it was called Kleptomaniacs because I had just learned the word kleptomaniac and it was awesome when I was 15. <laughs> I changed the name to the formation of the Stardust Gang when I rewrote it as an adult. Um, because I had to call the gang something, and I thought, oh, it's the Stardust Gang. And my buddy Mike Substelny, after reading that first 10,000-word draft, said, you need to call it the Galactic Hellcats. And I was like, you're so fucking right. Um, wow, what a good title. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> hey. Um I don't know if Mike. I don't know if Mike is watching, but if he is, hi, Mike. And maybe for my next book, apparently you're good at titles, so maybe you can title my next book for me. That'd be great. Um, so, Body of Stars, to me now, this title seems like the only title the book could have. Uh, it just seems completely natural. I can't believe it wasn't the title from day one. But for a number of years, it had a different title, and I don't even really want to share it. But it had um, it had constellations in it, so it was still starry. It was still that's kind of a metaphor in the book about these patterns on the body being like constellations, how they're arranged. And for other reasons, that title it just wasn't quite right. There are just some angles to it that I wasn't really happy with, and so I started looking for a new title. And it took me an embarrassingly long amount of time. And so I approached it like I do a lot of the writing process and that probably a lot of people approach titles. I just started making really long lists and most of the titles were terrible. And I could tell that, but you kind of can't really know until you just write everything down. So I would make lists like in the morning before I went to work um, at Cleveland Public Library, by the way, I would make lists of titles. And then I got some books out from the library about um, 
various various space related star related celestial related topics and i would read those and just look for phrases or try to look for concepts i knew i wanted it somehow to involve a, a celestial theme so i was just making lists and lists and lists and i think it was from one of those books where it just mentioned a body of stars or bodies of stars and i wrote that on my list and i still didn't know that that was the title it still took me at least a few days i think for it to kind of sink in and to realize that you know of course it has double meanings body of stars as as actual stars in the sky which is part kind of part of the book and also most of all that the bodies of women and girls kind of contain this magical power. They contain these constellations of markings. And so when I kind of finally let myself get it, I realized it was perfect. And um, it has just been that ever since. And I'm glad that I finally landed on that title. Um, sometimes titles are really hard. Sometimes for short stories, I never find the right title. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. What about- have Terrible titles. I usually joke that the title is what it is in the tin. You know, like I had a story that was yeah. called Robot Mermaid with Lasers for Eyes. And I thought that was a great title, but apparently. <laughs> I would read it. <laughs> I thought it was good. Did it get changed? It got changed. Yeah. It changed to see, seeing clearly when I sold the story to Little Blue Marble. But yeah. And that, that might be something to point out to if we have any aspiring writers on, on this, uh, watching this, is your title is subject to change for anything, whether it's a story or a novel. And you also can't copyright titles and it is normal for there to be more than one book out there with the same title or similar titles, it happens. Um, obviously you want to make sure your, your book title isn't on like a, a, a recent book published around the same time in the same genre, like, right? You want there to be some kind of defining line, but publishers it, change yeah. titles. Yeah, yeah, you have to Google it. And I think that is a really scary moment because I think I Googled Body of Stars and there was nothing at the time. Uh, a book did come out, I think a few years ago, Body Full of Stars. So that comes up now when I search, but I don't worry about that. It's not that, it's a different type of book. But, um, and publishers can want to change titles. And um, my editor and I never, I don't think we ever talked about the title because I was curious because I, you never know, maybe, they would have different thoughts on the title. And so I was really curious what would happen and just no one mentioned it. I think my assumption is everyone just thought it was the perfect title like I did, so it was fine. <laughs> I had a short story where we went back and forth on the title like 18 emails before we changed it and picked a title. So yeah, don't freak out too much about your title. That's yeah. My yeah. And it's also it's and if you're querying agents or looking for a publisher, I mean, it's always nice if you have a really catchy title that can maybe only help you, but really everyone knows it can be changed at any time. So the pressure is not that high for a title. Oh, nice. Um, we have another viewer question. Um, what advice do you have for young girls who are just getting interested in writing? Learn computer programming. <laughs> no, I mean, yes, but also write. <laughs> no, I mean, no, yeah, I mean, it's, it's never gonna be your day job. Um, it's very unlikely that you can make a career out of it, but definitely writing is fun and rewarding and um, just the way that you get better at it is to keep doing it. Um, keep writing and keep reading. The more you read, the better you get at writing. Yeah, I mean, Marie is exactly right. And this is kind of the advice you'll hear from a lot of places, you do have to be a reader and you should love reading, you know, not just trying to make yourself do it for research. Um, you should love reading, read what you enjoy, no matter what that is. And when it comes to writing also, I think really embrace the fun of it. And hopefully this is easier for either for your children or, or younger people, just um, really try to hold on to that sense of play because when you start trying to publish, it can get really hard. It can get frustrating. Uh, or if you're writing, if your drafts aren't going as well as you would like them to, uh, you feel kind of beaten down by rejection or how long it takes. Publishing is also really, really slow. And so I think no matter how old you are or what stage of, of your career that you're in, you have to love writing, like reading and the act of writing and the creative act and going through that because you cannot base it on external validation like a publication. It's wonderful to publish a story or a book or a poem or whatever you're working on that is really lovely, 
But if you're not in it for the writing itself, uh, you're, I think you'll be, you won't have any fun and, and it will ultimately be disappointing, I think. So just hold on to that fun and uh, remind yourself why, why you're doing it. Is it creating imaginative worlds? Is it making things up? That's what I always loved about it. Um, the love of language for me was a big one. And if you love language and that part of it, you know, read a lot of good books with language that you love and let yourself play around with, with language. Um, I had a book specific question for both of you. Um, Marie, I loved like the team up, like um, ragtag crew kind of aspect to your book that they all were, you know, had their issues, um, but they kind of found their own place within the team. I just wanted to know about how you write your characters and how that came about. I always wanted to be a part of a ragtag team. I always wanted to be a part of a of a club or a gang. I was always, as a kid, inventing new clubs and demanding that my friends joined them and we would be a club now and we have a logo, but this didn't really fly. Um, so there's a lot of wish fulfillment in this. And I mean, every character a writer writes is a little bit themselves, but definitely they're all very different women. Um, like key is me with absolutely no filter right and margo is the cautious you know worried about the day job me and zuleika is the shy awkward me um i approached well the characters all came from a sketch my sister drew that was where this all started when i was 15 and my twin sister drew a sketch of three punk teenage girls like lounging around a motorcycle and she drew it on a spiral notebook cover and I was like I'm gonna write a story about them uh, so a lot of the characterizations just came from the postures of that drawing I also I wanted them to be different so one of them had to be taciturn one of them had to be talkative one of them had comes from a poor background one of them comes from a rich background um, they all have different hangups. Like I just kind of, when I approach character, I think the most meaningful advice I ever got about writing a character is that character comes through contradiction and everybody has a base contradiction in them. And a person is gonna feel real if you address this contradiction, if they are brave, but chicken shit. If they are, um, you know, talkative, but shy. Um, so each of them has this sort of contradiction in them. He is a kleptomaniac, but she is absolutely not materialistic at all. She doesn't want the stuff. She just wants to steal it. Um, Zuleika is very taciturn and shy but she's also very much interested in people and she's all, she's very observant about people. And Margot is very tense and anxious and um, just, you know, she wants to follow the rules, but she's also the one who ends up getting them through their biggest heists. Um, she's also very brave. She's, she just doesn't know it. So that's how I approach character. Thanks. No, thanks. I really enjoyed that. Um, and then Laura, I wanted to ask you and have you talk a little bit about the theme um, about women and uh, the control that they have over their own bodies. Um, in your book, it also reminded me of like some dystopian themes from other books and then also, you know, relating to things that happen in real life. So I wondered if you could tell me a little more about that theme. Yeah, so I've I've always been interested in in writing about you know women and you know certain power struggles between characters. And when I first came up with the idea for this book, with the premise that only women's bodies can predict the future, I knew right away that this was going to lead to some uh, big tensions in the book, especially with gender dynamics and gender roles and how men and women act with each other. And I knew if it was either like our world or a bit more regressive, that's how I imagined the world of the book. I knew that if women had this ability to 
have future events outlined in their skin, that it would give them a lot of power. It would be a really kind of this amaz amazing, magical, wondrous thing that they could do. But if the world was at all structured like our world, I knew that they might not always be the ones in control of it and that men would be eager to read their own futures in women and that they would want to have, you know, as if they can't, they can't have that ability themselves. So what can they, they do to make sure they kind of have, have in on it in a way or have some control over it. And I mean, the metaphor for me when I came up with the idea was just really, really obvious about, you know, a woman's body and how much of it, how much control does she have over that body and by extension control over her own future. And we see that play out in our real world in a lot of different ways. It could be something as simple as motherhood, where when a woman has a baby, maybe doesn't always feel completely like she's her own person fully, that she is now this, by extension, um, a mother with a capital M, and that her body might not be fully her own you know, during that period. And to a lot of darker issues too, just in terms of choice and in terms of you know what decisions are women and girls trusted to make for themselves and what is not allowed and how does that affect the rest of their lives and how they live their lives, how they have freedom and autonomy and their careers, their education, all of this. So I, I think when I first came up with the idea, I could sense that all of this was sort of packed in there and that I, I knew I would have kind of a long road to untangle it all. And maybe that's why it took me so long because there were so many, for me, complicated implications and themes for for what this would mean for women and girls and some of the themes get get a bit dark it's you know there's some difficult things that happen in the book and i never set out wanting to write about some of them but i think i knew i had to because if i'm viewing this as a mirror to our own world i think that's what you know speculative fiction if that's what you want to call it i think that's what it does and so i knew from the beginning that I'm going to have to face some of these some of these things that I don't really want to, but I but that I will have to on the page, um, and I had to do that for the book. Well, thanks. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Ken. Um, he asks, uh, "Was there anything you thought about editing out of your books that you're especially glad that you kept in?" There's a throwaway. There's two throwaway characters. Um, when they end up with the, they end up among some uh, space nomad pirates called the ship folk. And there's two characters in there, BD and Honor, who are a brother and sister. And they were big in my 15 year old draft. And I thought to myself, I don't need to include BD and Honor and how they, their dynamic, but I'm glad that it's still in there because I'm pretty sure in the, um, they're coming back in the sequel. And then for me, I think this is a great question, by the way, and I think I might have to mull over it later just on my own because now I'm curious. I can't think of anything that I had thought about editing out that I left in. I did a lot of revision work on this and a lot. <laughs> I rewrote parts of the book multiple times and I don't really have any regrets about, I don't think I cut anything you know, beyond what I should have. If anything, when I look back on that editing and revision process, I'm glad for everything I might've cut out. And then it was a lot of adding in for world building details. So um, both before I got my book deal and then afterward with my editor who had just really smart insights into this world. And so then that you really came down to adding some more details that were maybe necessary for the book. And I don't think, I mean, I, I got a lot of reactions because I did revise this book for a number of years before it even went on submission to editors, before editors even saw it. And I think some people, I, I just, I talked to in casual conversation, questioned if I was revising too much, quote unquote. And I think there is this anxiety that you can revise too much and make it worse. And I mean, at least for me, because for me, this book was really complicated to think through the world and to understand and to write all the many themes that are kind of wrapped up in here. Um, I really, really kind of feel strongly that if you give it time and you follow your instincts, which is the most important thing a writer can have is to develop their instincts, which you can only do over time, is I don't think you can really make it worse in revision. I think you 
at least for me, I could only make it better. And so, um, so yeah, I can't think of anything that I'm, I'm glad I, I kept in. I'm just glad I kept revising is how I would answer that question. I'm glad there were so many times I thought I couldn't go on anymore, that I couldn't revise it anymore, that it just wasn't possible. And I would give myself a break from it. And it's amazing what some time away and some perspective can do. And then you could see, see it in a new light and find um, ways to go deeper in revision. Yeah, three years of shipping the book around and right before I sent it to vernacular, I cut an entire chapter. So, and I'm glad I cut that mm. chapter. It was a bullshit chapter. It needed, it needed to <laughs> um, well, I would love to keep talking to you, but I just have one more question. Um, I want to know what's up next for both of you. I'm working on a sequel to Galactic Hellcats. Galactic Hellcats in Love. And I have a novella coming out through analog science fiction. It's called The Unlikely Heroines of Callisto Station. Uh, it's going to be an analog magazine sometime this summer, I think. Um, and it's about a uh, young engineer with bipolar disorder fighting space pirates. And I am working on a lot of different things, but I have two short stories coming out um, sometime in the future that I'm excited about. And I, I probably won't mention where yet, just because I, you know, until they come out, I'm a little superstitious about that. But one of them is with more of a science fiction market that I'm really excited about. And I'll be sure just to share that online because it is, um, it will be available online. And the other one is, I think, more of a literary market, but maybe with some genre bending elements, which is perfect for me. And that one, um, if anyone out there is watching, from Lit Cleveland, you might have heard me read from part of this story a few years ago at the incubator. It's about um, a girl who gets a pet Satan, like a little dog, but it's a Satan, a little devil. And um, so I really had fun with that, like really zany kind of wild stories coming out. And I am working on another novel that I'm trying to figure out. Um, and I know we're running out of time. And so I just quickly want to squeeze in if I can that you know, this event is hosted by Cleveland Public Library and they are my employer. <laughs> and um, so one thing I wanted to add is just libraries for a writer are so important. So if you're a writer, you know, support your library, whoever, wherever it is and um, make use of it. I've done so much research for Body of Stars at Cleveland Public Library by checking out books and making use of their collections, all the novels in their literature department that have informed me and made me a better reader. And um, just having a job there, a flexible job that has over the years given me the security of, of having a job, but also having the time to write and work on this book specifically. So I just want to give a huge thank you to Cleveland Public Library and everyone there. Oh, well, that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to just add to thank the Cleveland Public Library for hosting us tonight and to thank both of you for your time. I'm really glad. I'm happy I got to read both of your books and meet you in over <laughs> Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Not thanks so much, Sarah. Next year yeah. in the flesh. Yeah, that would be great. All right. Well, thanks so much. And um, I hope to see more of you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, thanks Bye. everybody. Yes. Library books. Loganberry and books. Logan Berry Logan Berry. Berry. <laughs> buy, buy our books at Loganberry, please. Yes. yes, we'll be signing them. So if you like put a note when you buy it, um, we can sign them to you specifically. And we would love to do that. That's an author's dream, going to a bookstore and signing books. That's really the best part of the job. Yeah, we'll be doing that tomorrow. It's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Bye.